Good evening, everybody. I'm Katharina von Rüktischel. I'm the director of the Goethe Institute here in London. I'm, I'm super excited to have you here for our first annual lecture in the course of uh, the Jubilee events we have this year because the Goethe Institute London is 60 years old. Can you imagine? It looks younger, don't you think? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I want to welcome you very much here, and not only those who are here in the auditorium, but also all of you joining us via the live stream. And uh, we are in for a real treat tonight. I'm very excited that Nita Sanyal has accepted our invitation for this special evening. She will share the lecture with us, politics and what love got to do with it. And I promise she's as vivacious as Tina Turner. She won't sing, but she, yeah, well, you will see. A very warm welcome to you, dear Mito. And I'm very happy that you're here because we invited her last year and Corona prevented it. And this year for our Jubilee, you can make it wonderful. Mito Sanyal is a novelist, academic, literary critic, columnist, and broadcaster from Düsseldorf. Her work has been published by international newspapers, including The European, The Guardian, Die Zeit, Süddeutsche Zeitung, NZZ, Frankfurter Rundschau, and more. Her books include a Cultural History of the Vulva and also Rape from Lucrezia to Me Too. Her debut uh, novel was always Identity that was shortlisted for the German Book Award and is published in English in, uh, by Astra House and V&Q Books. She has just finished another book about Emily Bronte, very excited, which is due in October 22. Actually, it's there already. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, I have to read it. <laughs> um, Jörg Scheller from the NZZ sums it up perfectly when he says, Sanyal provides no easy answers, but asks agonizing questions. Also tonight, questions about politics. Who believes that love and politics shouldn't go together? We've seen it before and we will see it again, but are we living in a world where our politics are devoid of love and empathy? The Con uh, Conservative Party here in the UK, for instance, would not go so far as to refer to love but they are certainly using the term compassionate government. In the last few weeks, at least, they did. And I wonder whether, me too, you would agree? Me too suggests that sex and kink are easy topics and satisfies the media's hunger for headlines, but that love is seen as too cute, too lovey-dovey for politics. What has happened to what has happened to marginalize love in the political discourse? And what can political politics inform by love? And uh, how could that look like? So thank you for bringing these questions to us, me too. I'm looking forward to hearing your perspective. I suspect that many of you hold strong feelings on this subject. That's why I think you are here. And after the lect lecture, we will have a chance to post questions and responses during the Q&A, hosted by Nastaran Tavakolifa, uh, a journalist and host of radio, podcast, and TV. She is fascinated by why we humans do what we do and specializes in politics, economics, technology, and psychology. After the Q&A, Conversation can be continued upstairs in the library with a drink and or two and some nibbles. So I hope you all can come uh, and stay here for conversations afterwards. And special thanks to Paul Bryce Jones and Dee Simpson, who are providing BSL interpretation for any sign language users in the audience. And I want to thank very much our program team, especially Francis, who organized this event today and our fascinating technician Ho. Thank you so much. And now I have, uh, I hand over to Mito Sanyal for politics, what's gov love got to do with it? Mito, the floor is yours.
Thank you so much, Katharina. It's really hard to follow this up. I, I won't be like Tina Turner, sorry. <laughs> I can't <laughs> provide that. Um, first of all, I want to say I'm very happy that you're all here, and I love you very much. I love you, Katharina. I love you, Nas. I love all of you. But what does that mean? I mean, <laughs> what does it mean when I say I love you? And don't worry, I don't want to... Can I say fuck in a good lecture? I don't want to make love to you all, or at least not in this sense. Um, even though I think that after the last two or three years, we could all do with a lot more sex. Or am I just speaking for myself? Anyway, too much information. It's always good to start with too much information. Um, of course, I'm speaking about love. I'm a woman. I'm so cis that I haven't worn a pair of trousers in five years, maybe. Love is what being a woman is all about, still speaking of cis women here. In our society, we don't just gender bodies, we gender emotions as well. Is love an emotion? Good question. Let's talk about that later. So in our society, we gender love as female. Women are supposed to desire love. Okay, being loved. To see love as their raison d'etre which is why they're also supposed to do all the work of love, the thinking and the talking and the caring. And because they do it for love, they do it for free. And this is a problem. And I don't have to tell you that. We all know that this is a problem. That's why we've become suspicious of love. Feminists and anti-racists and anti-fascists. And yes, of course, I come from Germany. <laughs> this is the Goethe Institute. And artists and activists, we all have become jumpy when love is mentioned. We can have kinky sex and talk about taboos till the cows come home to be fucked. But love is, ooh. Because love is a kind of colored beads we get offered instead of equal pay or any pay more often. And I'm speaking about romantic love here. And I could spend the whole lecture ranting about the ideal of romantic love. But I'm not going to, because attention is energy. And I don't want to waste any more energy on romantic love. Because when we do one thing, we can't do another at the same time. And I want to talk about love in a political sense. And I want to drink in between. It's almost nice to watch people drinking on stage. You've seen it here. And I want to talk about the function of love in and for communities. And I want to talk about the role of love in politics. And why I want a politics of love. Because I could have started very differently. I could have started like this. Dear listeners. In this lecture, I will point out the conflict lines of our time, Putin and the corona measures, and Putin and, oh, I've deleted Listress here, and Putin. And afterwards, you'll all be able to rant about the screwed up people who disagree with us. Because I will explain to you what makes them tick, because I am able to read minds. And then we, don't, we won't be much smarter, but our views will be confirmed. And that's good enough for a speech after all, isn't it? And this is, of course, irony. But at the moment, a lot of political an analysis and argument follows these patterns, really. So basically, we all say, aren't these people stupid because they're stupid and everybody agrees? Um, and I've always thought that was because we don't listen enough to each other. We don't understand what the other people means. We don't understand the other people's arguments enough. We don't have enough knowledge. And so I've talked more and more and some more. And, and when I look back at all the lectures I've given and the discussions in social and traditional media um, and everything, I've often experienced that even all the arguments have been exchanged. We're still angry. And, and uh, <laughs> that always makes me think of an ex-boyfriend of mine who was convinced I just didn't understand him when I disagreed and kept on explaining. And sometimes I feel like we've all become that ex-boyfriend. And that's quite a chilling thought. So let's take a step back. Even without politics, love is a revolutionary act. And why is love such a revolutionary act? Because the first thing we teach people that we want to subdue or colonize or discriminate against, the first thing we teach them is that they are not lovable. Um, and this is so important because we only have empathy with people we consider as worthy of being loved, worthy of love which is also why only these people can claim empathy. So it's no coincidence that marginalized people share the feeling that they're less worthy than others to be more, to 
precise, less worthy of love. I was told to go as close to the microphone as possible. Maybe I shouldn't listen. Um, and, and a sentence like, why would anybody love someone like me or shorter? Do I deserve love? Isn't an individual sentence or an individual problem. It's a structural problem. And of course, it can become an individual problem, but that's another lecture. And um, the fear not to be loved, to have to do an enormous amount of work to deserve love, does something to us. And it does something detrimental to us. And this is a trick with love, with the threat of losing love. It's a political weapon, and it doesn't even have to be a real threat. Just the fear of losing love or never getting enough love is enough to cripple people, psychologically and physically. Um, and the writer and philosopher James Baldwin describes this very impressively. In 1971, he wrote an open letter to philosopher and civil rights activist Angela Davis, who was in prison at the time. Dear sister, writes Baldwin, come in, you're very welcome. The American triumph, in which the American tragedy has always been implicit, was to make black people despise themselves. Black people were killing each other every Saturday night out on Lenox Avenue when I was growing up. And no one explained to them or to me that it was intended that they should, that they were penned where they were like animals in order that they should consider themselves no better than animals. And few writers have better expressed the challenge and pain and, and the difficulty of loving yourself under these conditions. And by the way, Angela Davis was freed from prison by a massive wave of solidarity, nationally and internationally. And that was the first example of successful love politics that I can remember in my life. So we can change the way our love can change the way the world is. But back to James Baldwin. I love James Baldwin so much because James Baldwin loves so much. Because Baldwin connects with the world via love. And that includes the world of thought as well. And he never abandons this connection, no matter how much the world tries to make him hate. And he writes, I saw nothing very clearly, but I did see that, that my life, my real life was in danger. And not from anything other people might do, but from the hatred I carried in my own heart. And his essay, Letter from a Region in My Mind, um, appeared in the New Yorker in 1962. And in it, he explains that hate is self-destructive and that we need love to transform ourselves and society. And he says, the relatively conscious whites and the relatively conscious blacks must, like lovers, insist on or create the consciousness of the other. And he means we don't have to cuddle with our opponents. We don't have to like everything we do, they do. We don't even have to feel a deep sense of attachment to them. But we have to base our relationship on love, act like lovers. And in response, the philosopher Hannah Arendt wrote to him, your article in The New Yorker is a political event of the highest order. I think. It certainly is an event in my understanding of what is involved. Brilliant. Brilliant. It has cut. Basically, it has cut a line. Well done, me too. Um, basically, she says that, that, that his article changed her understanding of the N-word question. And that is really impressive because racism was to put it blind, politely, the blind spot in Hannah Arendt's work. And only three years earlier, she'd spoken out against the abolition of race segregation in schools in an article. And so that is really interesting. So she can change her mind about race, but she can't change her mind about love. So um, she writes him, only in one point she vehemently de disagrees with him. She writes, in politics, love is a stranger. And when it introduces upon it, nothing is being achieved except hypocrisy. And this is based on Hannah Arendt's conviction that love cannot be political because love negates plurality. Whereas for Baldwin, plurality is a precondition for love. I think they're talking about different kinds of love, by the way. And they're talking about different kinds of experiences. But that is very, very, very interesting. Um, and and um, he says, um, 
love is not a sentimental escapism, but a confrontation with the world. And she says, no, love is just, we want to just see ourselves in the other, and so there's no plurality. And he says, no, it's the opposite. We want to understand, we want to take somebody else as seriously as we take ourselves. And so he says, sentimentality, the ostentatious parading of excessive and spurious emotion is the mark of dishonesty, the inability to feel, the wet eyes of the sentimentalist betray his aversion to experience his fear of life, his arid heart, and it's always there for the signal of secret and violent inhumanity, the mask of cruelty. I quote Baldwin here so much because I really like his writing. I really like the sound of his voice. <laughs> so, sorry, Hannah Arendt. In this case, I do agree with James Baldwin, even though I love Hannah Arendt, pre precisely because I love her. Hannah doesn't have to be perfect to deserve my love. And for that reason, I can deal with the fact that there are central parts of Hannah Arendt's work that are very, very racist indeed. And that's plurality. Perceiving others as different from, from us and still loving them. Not agreeing with them, but still loving them. Because the you is always bigger than the I. So our shared humanity is based on the fact that we are able, we are not able, to successfully pigeonhole the other person. And neither ourselves, so we can't pigeonhole ourselves either, by the way. So we are all many. We are contradictory. We are a bundle of emotions and feelings and thoughts and ideas. And the writer and anarchist Gustav Landauer once said, the most revolutionary act is to treat the people we love well. He hasn't said that. But what he said is, the state is a relationship. It is a partnership between people, a way that people relate to one another. We destroy the state by forming other relationships, by relating differently to each other. And that's why the philosopher Bell Hooks believes love, and defines love as the will to extend oneself for the purpose of nurturing one's others, one's own or another spiritual growth. And she also says, love isn't a feeling. Love is a verb. Love is something we do. We always tend to forget that. So to love means to recognize each other as equals, to place the concern for another person's welfare on the same level as the concern for our own welfare. Not higher, not lower, on the same level. So I'm not sacrificing myself for you when I say I love you, nor do I expect you to sacrifice yourselves for me. Um, and that's a problem because we, <laughs> um, we live in a culture where we... Where we then we live in a culture of, um, of compromise. So our idea is so everybody gives something up and then we meet in the middle. And what I do, what I'm talking about is a culture of consent, where people first have to say what they want, what they really want. But now our culture, basically, when we say what we want, we're seen as the, as the egotistical ones. So the more sacrifices we make, the better we are. And I, I had a mother who, who really, she was a very good person. She made loads of sacrifices. And it's not easy to live with people like that. So in the end, there will always be some kind of leveling out, no matter how many sacrifices they make for you. And even if it's just your bad conscience. So it doesn't matter. So the idea of consent is when you really say what you mean, you take the other's needs as seriously or as, as, um, um, as your own then you will find something that you can both agree on. And then you can kind of, of um, cut what you're saying in smaller and smaller parts. And then you will be able to agree on something. And then we'll bo both be able to do that enthusiastically. And what we are doing in our, um, and our, our society, we always meet and everybody's kind of begrudged and kind of unhappy. But yeah, we're doing it. OK, fine. Everybody thinks we're paying more. Usually, uh, even in relationships, usually people think, I'm paying more. I'm paying more. Even when you go, go shopping, you think, I've, I've, I've spent more money. So, by the way, when I'm talking about political love, it always sounds like I'm demanding that we make our individual hearts bigger, that we can become better people, that we are really, really careful and all the time really look at everything. And that's always nice and fine, and of course we should all be better people, but I'm talking about structures here. I want structures that allow us to interact with each other in life-affirming ways. So here are some bullet points first. To make love politics possible, we need a shared social appreciation of love. Because the problem in capitalism is that the only social values are things that we can count. So like money or infection rates or weapons or whatever. 
But of course, economic values are not the only values, as we all know. But we cannot measure these other values. So we need a scale and understanding for these other values. And we need a fair economy of love. So when not one individual exploits the labor of love of another one because it's done voluntarily, out of love, so to speak, because then usually people on the lower un end of the, the status kind of ladder tend to do all the work of love. And that's not what it's about. So it's about giving this, the, giving love, giving the, the labor of love a status in society. Second bullet point. We need a community of memory. If we agree that plurality is the basis for our society, then we must also have a pluralistic view of the past. And I've just written a book about Emily Bronte and the main character, Heathcliff. Every page they say, oh, he's black, he's black, he's black, he's black. So then the first film in, in 2011, um, or 12, uh, Andrea Arnold made a film about Heathcliff, with, and, and he was played by a black actor, about two black actors, as a child and as a grown man. And everybody said, this is a surprising new adaptation of the story. And like, have you read the book? So we, we've got this idea that the past, the past was white. <laughs> the past was white. The past is a different country. Now we're different, but in the past we were, which is not true. The past is just as diverse as the present. So we have to have a diverse view of the past as well. And this means that all members of a society must be part of the culture of memory and not, as, as currently the case, a very small selection of the population because really who identifies with all the guys on horses we see right time. So I'm talking about statues, memorial days, street names, etc. Third bullet point, civic trust. We may not have a politics of love, but we live in a culture of hate. <laughs> it's a bit overdramatic. Yeah. But if we look at the news, the whole rhetoric is geared towards fear and division and banning things. So what can we ban now? So, and the conservative press blames Vogue, as if an adjective could do all that on its own. Um, and we, that's the political left, we blame the political right. And um, you should thank God that your language doesn't gender as rigidly as German, because in Germany, everybody blames everything on gendering, so gendering's fault. And the number one best-selling book in Germany at the moment tackles our dysfunctional political debates, which is really, really important. And it does so in the most dysfunctional language possible. We haven't learned how to do this. And that's why we need a rhetoric of trust, of, of finding common ground. We need to learn that. Because it's not that we're nasty. We simply have no idea how to do that. And that means we need to learn these skills. Instead, we learn debates like the Cambridge debate. And that means there are two opposite sides that defend their point. In the end, we all vote who's won as if these debates were wars. That's why, yeah, let's do that. Let's have two opposing sides and vote on it, like Brexit, that went well. So let's do that. Well done. So my fourth bullet point is we need an ed education and love strategies in de-escalation and radical happiness in non-violent communication and so on. Because the sociologist George Yancey suggests, I want you to listen with love. And in philosophy, this is called the principle of charity. That is to try to understand what the other pe person says in the best possible sense, and not to jump on certain buzz points, ah, points, ah, a pilzer, a person I love to hate, like a corona denier, or boomer, or doomer. Or Germany say schwurbler, which basically means if you say something I don't agree with, then you just say bullshit, um, and so on. So love politics, by the way, also means listening to ourselves with love, looking at ourselves with that loving gaze. Um, but before we're able to do that, we have to feel safe. Um, only sometimes we can take away all the threat and we still don't feel safe. And that's interesting. So, so I'm, because I'm, I'm a cultural scientist, so um, I always talk about, about knowledge and talking and everything. But there's a lot of research being done at the moment about the discuss, uh, connection, for example, between disgust and fear. And we always think, oh, yeah, we're, we're more racist because it's fear of the other. So that's xenophobia, fear of the other. But very often we're told the correct term should be hate of the other. But 
research actually suggests that it should be called disgust of the other, because disgust seems to come before fear. So, for example, there was an experiment that um, the psychologist David Pizarro did at Cornell University, and he would put people in a room and he pumped bad smells into the room, and then they had to do a multiple choice test. And in, in the people in the room with the, with the bad smells, they were a lot more conservative, their answers were a lot more conservative than on the other day when they were in a room without bad smells. So that's very interesting. So disgust does something to our political view of the world. Also, people in neighborhoods with a lot of germs and bacteria are more afraid of others. And here becomes incredibly interesting and murky. If the threat of infectious disease makes us more fearful, and it does, as research suggests, and if that fear makes us more racist, then that's really bad news at the moment. So I, I've put insert far joke here because I haven't got a solution. Anyway, we've got to deal with that. Let's move to my fifth bullet point quickly. We also need civic grace. Civic grace is the willingness to let go of political resentment in order to work together towards a common goal versus political resentment, which is, which is a threat to democracy. And my colleague, the author, Kubra Gumishai, puts it so beautifully. She was here the other day, wasn't she? She says, we lack a culture of error. We are too quick to put people on in the identity pillory. So of course we can discuss or criticize individual statements, but we don't have a culture of learning from our mistakes or to simply disagree with each other. So if you look at the media at the moment, we seem to live in a culture where punishment is more important than change. And Stephen Fry said, do you want to be right or effective? And very often it seems like people, it's more important for people to be right than effective. And there are loads of, um, loads of research, for example. Um, in America, when it's about um, abortion rights, so um, Usually, when you want to want to convince someone of your your viewpoint, you got to um, you got to look at what's important to them. But so um, the the political right at the moment, they all talk about um, the, the right to live. So that's exactly what doesn't interest. So they they talk about religion, and that that won't convince anybody on the left. And the left talk about the right to your own sexuality, which won't convince anybody on the right. So it's basically. It's a waste of arguments. So it's, it's not kind of what could reach the other person first of all. And that's something that's happening a lot in our political discussion. We haven't learned how can we basically, first of all, understand the other viewpoint in this. Um, and research, show, research shows that the dynamics that lead to outrage, so like scandalizing, calling out, are not the same ones that affect change. So if I say to someone, you're an evil person, and how dare you? Then they won't reply, oh, thank you, Mito, for telling me. I'll change that immediately. But this is how we think political discussions should work. So, um, and, and we always think of dysfunctional families as char characterized by violence. So everybody's hitting each other on the head. But actually, that's not true. They're characterized by boredom, because everyone is afraid of making a mistake. So in functional families, People can make mistakes because they know them. They can just learn from mistakes and they, they'll still be loved. They'll still be part of the community. And the more dysfunctional, the more people are afraid of ostracized, to be ostracized, and they just basically shut up. And it's incredibly boring. Originally, I thought the sixth bullet point would be empathy. <laughs> I've been thinking a lot about the difference between empathy and compassion lately. Because empathy means we have a lot of empathy with people who are similar to us, and the more similar, the more empathy, but that also means the less similar, the less empathy. So at the moment, you have a lot of empathy with refugees from Ukraine. That's brilliant. Let's keep that up. However, at the same time, refugees from nearly everywhere else can still drown in the Mediterranean. And that is that we do that at the same time, and we don't seem to, to have a problem with doing that at the same time. Compassion, on the other hand, is not limited to members of our own group. For compassion, I don't even have to agree with these people. They don't even have to be good people. Compassion is unconditional. Okay, that's all good and well, but shouldn't we talk about the real problems of our time? So what about the climate crisis? 
that Van Gogh way was a little bit more loving. So, what about the climate crisis? I've been incredibly impressed by the work of Robin Wall Kimmerer. Robin Wall Kimmerer is a professor of environmental, uh, environmental and forest biology and the director of the Center for Native Peoples and the Environment at the State University of New York. She belongs to the citizen Potawatomi. And at the beginning of each class, she gives her students a questionnaire asking them to rate the interaction between humans and the environment. And as a rule, all her students state that we are harmful to the environment, we exploit the earth, cause climate change, poison fields, pollute water, you, you know the list, I don't have to go through it all. Um, you probably remember the memes at the beginning of the corona crisis. So now that people are not leaving the houses because of lockdown, the dolphins are coming back into the Thames and all that. Um, do you remember those? We had loads of those. And um, loads of people, and by that I mean my friends, they commented, oh God, we humans, we are the, the, the virus of the world. And so that, that doesn't give us much hope. So we, we hope to be extinct as quickly as possible to, to, to save the environment. That can't be the solution. But this is basically what all these students were suggestion, uh, suggesting in the questionnaire. And further down, I remember Kimura asked them to list any positive interactions they know between humans and nature. And the answer was, no, none. So we can't even imagine what a positive interaction might look like. And, and this from young people who are studying this subject to protect the environment. No idea what that might look like. Because like all of us, they've grown up with the narrative that we are separate. So we are separate from each other and from nature. And, and um, we are individuals on a speck of dust hurtling through the universe, basically. But if we perceive ourselves as separate from nature, we cannot interact with it in any meaningful way. So we cannot interact with it in a kind of um, consensual way. So what we can do is exploit the environment, have domination over the earth like the Bible says, or we can save it, which is basically the same thing. So we're doing it not, on, on, uh, not eye to eye, um, but we can't live with it as, as consensual adults, as consensual beings. And Robin Wakimura says that the average American child knows the names of more than 100 corporate logos, but only of 10 plants. And I asked my children, that is more or less true? And this is a problem because we can only recognize what we already know. So if you don't know plant, we literally don't see it. And the technical term for that is nature blindness or plant blindness. So the less names we have for the living world around us, the less we learn to value it, the less we learn to care for it, to have an emotional connection to it. And Robin Wakimura concludes that it's not the environment that is destroyed, it's our relationship to the environment that is destroyed. Or as the ethnobotanist Gary Nason puts it, we cannot move towards healing restoration without restoration. And one example, one positive example, so how can we do that? Um, that she gives us the, this, the honorable harvest. So that's basically the indigenous way of receiving nature's gifts. So like kind of you don't pick the first berry, so you'll never pick the last. And you give something back to the plant to express your gratitude, like a song or prayer, or you distribute the seeds and so on. You care for it. And Robin Wilkimmer conducted an experiment at her university where a doctoral student staked out different plots in a meadow with sweet grass. And sweet grass is threatened with extinction there. So she left one of these plots completely alone, which is roughly our idea of conservation, conservation so keep our hands off. Um, one of the plots she harvested carefully by cutting off the stalks, but only half of them, not all of them. And from the third plot, she pulled the grass out of the ground by the roots. That's the way that basket weavers didn't do that traditionally, but also only half of the grass. And the biggest challenge for the PhD student was to express her gratitude for the gift of the sweet grass. But over the months, she began to feel kind of growing connection, a growing relationship with the grass. And she still couldn't bring herself to sing to it. That was the only thing that she couldn't do. So <laughs> it was part of the curriculum. You've got to sing to the grass. And that didn't work. And the result of the experiment, I think it was over two years, over a two-year period, was that the sweet grass on the plot that had been left alone was interspersed with dead stalks and 
and um, well, it thrived and multiplied on the other two plots that had been harvested. Um, it did so <laughs> most vigorously on the plot where the grass was pulled out by the roots. So that only works with sweet grass, not with other grass. Um, which is basically the way the bisons eat the grass too. They don't cut it off, obviously. So humans are not parasites. We have something to give, but to do so, we need to access the knowledge and practices of this interchange. And I have no idea how long I am. I've got, I, I brought a watch with me, left it upstairs. So what's the time now? How many, how many minutes have I got? Maybe five. Maybe five. Okay, then I jump over you. Very short time. And don't count jump over it. <laughs> Whatever. So um, Robin Wakimbo has written an essay that I really, really love. So it's called The Grammar of Animacy. And she writes that in Potawatomi, that's the language that her ancestors were not allowed to speak any longer. There's a word with the meaning, the power that drives the mushroom to push through the earth overnight. Pupovi. And this is such a great word. So why don't we have a word in our bi biological la language for that? So pupovi is a word from a language where the world is full of beings. So energy is invisible that move everything. While German and English are languages that are mainly made of above nouns. Um, and nouns are the most important words. In Potawatomi, it's the other way around. So 70% of all words are verbs. So there's to be a Saturday is a verb, to be a mountain, to be red, to be a lake, to be a tree. And a tree is only a noun, and that tree is dead. And you've cut it down and, and cut it into planks. Um, and Potawatomi is a gram of intimacy. And, um, when, for example, when we see our grandmother lying on the bed. We don't think, oh, it's in the bed. You would never refer to a person as it because it robs that person of their personality and makes them into an object. But we've made nature into objects. And by thinking about nature, by thinking about trees as it, we erect a barrier between the tree and us. We have no moral obligation towards that tree any longer. In the process, we don't just sever the tree from our empathy, we also sever ourselves from the living world around us. And that's why it was so overwhelming when activists succeeded in 2017 in getting the Wanganui River recognized as a person in New Zealand. And that was interesting because when through all the press, um, like, oh, that's, that's curious, that's something the Maori do, that's weird. While people all over the world are standing up for personality rights, for rivers, for lakes, for mountains, for forests, for moors. Because when a river is a legal person, then you can sue a company that's polluting that river. But it also means to acknowledge our need to live meaningful relationships with more than human entities. And that's love politics in action, love beyond the border of, 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 of our species. And a view of the world based on love will produce a different political theory and most likely a different political practice than one based on Okay, hate is a bit melodramatic, but how about a political theory based on struggle? And like the Hollywood actress Rose McGowan puts it, I scare because I care. And that's based on the idea we have to force people to behave, to behave so socially. Um, I genuinely believe that that's a fallacy. So that, that's based on um, doggy dog, the near theory, Lord of the Flies, all of this. So if you, if you don't make people, if you don't force people, then they will be really nasty to each other. And um, in 1965, there was actually, Lord of the Flies actually really did happen. There was six boys were shipwrecked on an island, Atta. And, and they didn't eat each other. They didn't beat each other up. One of them fell down a cliff, broke his leg, and the others just looked after him and fed him, and they were found, I think, two years later, a long time afterwards, and they were all still alive because we care for each other. We are not, it's not our, our deepest nature to be nasty to each other. We can be nasty, very much so, but that's not, we don't have to fight against our, our intrinsic evil. We've got to make it possible for us to live in these life-affirming ways. And in the 60s, love was the past of revolution, so make love, not war. And now love is seen as a diametrically opposed to us, diametrically opposed to that, as capitalism packs along as, as a commodification of desire. And that's why the left is so cautious or cynical about love. But this results in a lack of self-love, 
of concepts of self-care that do not immediately turn to cons consumerism. But even more importantly, it results in a lack of utopian thinking. And I've spent the last years, probably decades, writing against all kinds of things, against Donald Trump, against racism and sexism, and against all the misunderstandings, what that means, and so on. And at some point, I realized that I had to start writing for something. And I want to, I want to quote Kubra Gümüşay again, because I like, love her so very much. And she always, uh, she did a very be beautiful TED talk, I mean, she calls for politics of love. And she says, we need our own agenda in order not to only react to every bone that the right wingers throw us, but to be able to think of utopias, we need love. Thank you. Me too. That was really, really awesome. Um, I'm full of questions, so I, I'm going to throw it to the floor soon as well, but I'm full of questions, so I'm going to dive straight in. I um, wanted, wanted to start with, you talked of James Baldwin and how he's written so beautifully about all these concepts and topics, and you talked about his words to Angela Davis. So this brought to mind the fact that we're in a situation where I feel kind of for the past decade or so, um, what we might call marginalized groups. Um, a lot of them have been doing the work to foster that self-love, to foster, you know, the fact that, you know, I am worthy, um, regardless of what society has tried to teach me. Um, this is something I've done a lot of work with in the gender, gender sphere specifically. So like, you know, women trying to kind of get that sense. And you see this in all sorts of groups in terms of going back and looking at our culture and our history um, and really trying to kind of see, see our self-worth. Um, now, I wanted to know about I, I don't want to use the word oppressor, but I guess people who are part of the more privileged group, they're not really doing the similar work, and we are in this dynamic. So what is the incentive for them to look at their own backgrounds and you know have, have that level of self-love self on their end? That is so interesting because um, it's always very easy when I'm asked about men, for example. So, um, but in feminism, um, we, we, we know that men can only win from feminism as well because when we kind of free ourselves from gender stereotypes, it's not just that women are put into one box and men are also put in the other box. And um, so, so we kind of, um, we say women's work and women's voices are, well, roughly speaking, less worse worthy in our society, less well regarded in our society, while men's feelings and lives, so that men die five years earlier than women, has got nothing to do with they they breaking down quicker. No, it's it's the patriarchy basically. Um, so and even even um, I think lightning strikes men five times as um, as often as women. So it's nothing to do with sexism. <laughs> so lightning isn't sexist. It's because they're told, oh, a little bit of rain won't kill you. As it turns out. It does. Um, so that is easy. But when I'm talking about um, a kind of, uh, well, whiteness, so um, it took me a long time to fathom out what that might mean. And um, we spent a lot of time redefining being black, being of color. So um, the, the idea of um, white and black as different races came up. In well, with enlightenment, with enlightenment, with the transatlantic slave trade, and it came up to kind of justify that. So, with the, so the idea of white supremacy and whiteness that they, they were born at the same time, and um, so black people, um, other colonialized people, have worked against that. So, revolution, black is beautiful, black lives matter. All this is a fight against it. So you're still discriminated against, but the idea, so the blackness, um, being brown, has become human. While whiteness, we, we didn't talk about it, it was the norm, so it became invisible. And um, so if you talk about whiteness now, people tend to be really hurt. And part is because the only concept of whiteness that we have is white supremacy. So we have actually also got to make whiteness human. Because in a way, it's true that the first people we usually colonize is the people in our own country. And um, I mean, um, in Britain, it's, this is quite clear how that worked. In Germany, we don't see that so clearly because we don't look at it in that light. But so um, also the people they, they sent to the colonies usually were 
either working class people, because people in the colonies, only the most of the soldiers there only survived for two years, a very, very low life expectancy. So you, you use people from the working classes from Scotland, Wales, Ireland, send them to the colonies to die there. Wonderful. Um, so uh, looking at yourself with compassion doesn't mean to excuse everything, doesn't mean to, it's fine, <laughs> everything is fine, but um, looking at all of us as human beings and the idea of I've got to have a very, very bad conscience of being white, no, it doesn't help. <laughs> it's usually not very effective. So, so just on that point, um, how do we make whiteness human? That, that's, that's I have really no great. idea. I'm, I'm, I'm not, <laughs> how should I know? I am I'm not white. No, that, that's, I didn't know. <laughs> how did you get that so quickly? Um, I don't know. And I think that's one of the great challenges. And I genuinely believe we all, um, we all will gain so much. At the moment, the, the debate is always, oh, people have to give up something. And that's not very sexy. I mean, even if you're a very good human being, think, I will give up something, I'll give up something, I'll give up something. And you can do it only so much, so you can, you can also grow. And I think one of the things that you can regain is your connection. Because um, the first thing, if you look at Europe, um, especially uh, in the 19th century, it was... a uh, a nation that severed its, its connection to nature massively. I mean, that was the, the basically the end of the enclosure, so, so the high point of the enclosure. So you can look at all the big enclosure acts. They were at the beginning of the, in the 18, uh, 18 but basically all the, t every year there was a new enclosure act and a new anti-riot act against that and so on. Um, so that's one of the things, our connection to nature. It was also a time when um, that was very, very focused on military. To militarize a society, you've got to uh, sever their connection to each other. And, and, and you can't send people out to a war. Um, so uh, people don't like to kill each other. That's another thing. They did loads of research, uh, for example, in the American War. Um, um, uh, the the um, Civil War, they found all these muskets and they were reloaded 28 times. You can only load a musket once and then you have to discharge it. So why did the soldiers keep reloading? Because while you're reloading, you can't shoot somebody. So they kept, because they d it's, it's actually against our nature to shoot each other. And they're only looking at all the atrocities that we do and they are there. I don't deny those. But I think it's also very important to look at Actually, we don't want to do that. We do want to help each other, and that's there as well. I guess that goes into the restore. What, what's the restoration? Restoration. Yeah, yeah. Goes to that. So that's that's really interesting. I um, wanted to ask about culture of memory, um, and about us looking at the past as being much more diverse and different to how we read it and learn about it. Um, are there any specific examples of? this that have been done recently that you think are really effective that we can all learn from? Oh God, that is so difficult because you usually have all the examples where it went wrong. <laughs> so why don't we remember these? Well, first of all, um, what I loved about um, pulling down all the statues is that we have the feeling we own the past. So the past belongs to us all. So we all got to talk about it together. So uh, the conversation has changed. Um, in Germany, for example, so we changed the law. So for a very long time, memory politics only meant the Holocaust. And now memory politics in Germany officially also means our colonial past and loads of other things. And that doesn't mean it has to distract from each other. On the contrary, um, it can strengthen each other. So the first KZ, um, the first concentration camps, um, they were on the Haifish Inland, so in Namib Namibia, so at the beginning of the last century, so we tried it out there first, how to do that, so the, the, how to effectively kill and destroy people before we tried it out as white people at home. Um, and so we can, uh, so to, to do the, it sounds so cynical, I'm so sorry about this. Um, I, I really don't mean it, <laughs> it's because it's so nice and we're so relaxed here. So <laughs> so you know what I mean, you understand me, don't you? Um, and and it is, it's not, if you, if you, if you remember other peoples as well, you, um, the memory is, l is less. So memory isn't a resource that we haven't got enough of. We've got a lot. Empathy grows. So it, it will grow with um, the more complex our memories. But also we've got to learn to forget. That's the other thing. Um, so a lot of memory politics I find very disgusting. At the moment, mainly in, in India, we've got a lot of memory politics about partition, which is awful, and we've got to look at it, but it also... It's the way we do it at the moment is a way to foster, or to, to, to make these wounds fester 
So, so um, they can't heal. And we also, in, in the way we talk about memory politics, we've also got to talk about what do we need for forgiving? It's not just this is an atrocity that has happened, so how can we heal this atrocity? That's also incredibly important in this. Um, with, with love politics, how do we incentivize, I guess, anyone who's more privileged to get involved? and see that it is, I mean, you were talking about patriarchy and what you said is completely correct, but sometimes it's very hard if you're not actually suffering directly or in a more visible way to like see the incentive for you to, to be involved in that process. Um, I have no idea how to incentivize people, first of all, but what I do know is that doing politics, I used to do politics with this, I've got to give something. Um, solidarity means going over my own borders, so I had to do a lot with activist burnout, so um, most of the people I knew were basically doing, giving, 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 and then they were burned out, and they, they couldn't do politics for a while, and they were really depressed and all this. And so the idea of love politics is also we should do politics in a life-affirming way, because then it's also quite sexy to do it. <laughs> so people would maybe want to do it. We don't have to tell them, hey, this is really nice. They, they might come on their own accord. I'm going to open to the floor in a, in a minute. Um, before we, we go there, um, you also talked about giving love a status in society. Um, again, wanted to know, are there sort of any examples, maybe even historically, where this has been done that we can learn from? Um, well, first of all, um, we have started looking at history like there were other kinds of ways of organizing society. And for a long, long time, we, we didn't have this idea. We had this idea, oh, there might have been a matriarchy, which was exactly the same as patriarchy, only women did everything that men were doing. So the same, basically, it was um, a different role. So um, now we do know there are loads of societies that are kind of based on consent, so there are consent societies and, and, and everything. But what I mean by, by um, a love as a status is um, at the moment we have this idea, so um, we'll, we have this idea of living in a meritocracy, which is um, not the case. We know our, our society is very much ruled by class, but um, even if we did live in a meritocracy, that would be awful, because that would mean if you succeed, it's because you're good. You're, you're worthy of succeeding. So if you don't succeed, you're just not very good and not, not a good human being. You, you should, well, <laughs> fine, it's your own fault. Um, and, and what are what are the values that we base that on? So is somebody who can run faster, is he a better human being than somebody who can listen to someone well? Um, so what can, even if we lived in a meritocracy, what kind of um, skills would we consider as worthy of being, um, of giving attention? So if you are able to, if you go into a group, the group becomes more functional. There are people usually, if you live in a shared flat or shared house, usually there are people moving in and suddenly it, it's all, it all works and they're moving out and it doesn't. So they, they, this is a skill, this is a fantastic skill. And, and we basically, we have no idea how to um, evaluate these skills. And at the moment, the only way of evaluating things is paying them. So I, I would definitely suggest to pay certain jobs better than others. Uh, or, or, or basically, basically, first of all, pay certain jobs well, full stop. Um, so all the jobs that in, involve caring, listening, looking after the weaker people in our society, Young and old people, we all, we, we've all been young, and if you're lucky, we all get old. So these are really the worst paid jobs. There's a really a massive problem with these jobs. So this is, even if you're just thinking egotistically as a society, this doesn't make sense. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm going to open up in a second. Just before that, the, the other thing, I think when we talk about love, it's hard not to talk about shame as well. Um, and the role shame plays in our politics, especially right now, um, which kind of stops us from actually being able to hear each other and, you know, othering other people is basically what we do with shame. Um, how do we deal with shame when we're talking about love politics? And I'm wondering, especially given the climate we're in right now. Climate of shaming and blaming, <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I love this because shame is a social emotion. We all think shame is just an emotion, but they're social emotions. So if you're naked and go through a city, you won't feel shame if nobody's around. You might feel cold, but you won't feel shame. So shame is basically connected to other people looking at you. So shame is a social interaction. And um, I think it was Confucius, one, one, one of those um, people said shame is incredibly useful because if there's shame, um, you don't have to rule over people. They, they basically make themselves comply. And um, 
I don't, I'm not talking about conscience. I think a conscience is a very good thing. You, you want to, um, well, you want to act in a way that you think is ethical. That's a different thing. So very, very often shame and, and, and to be a conscientious per person is kind of confused with each other. But if you think, would you do this? Would you think it's okay doing this if nobody else noticed it? There are loads of things I still wouldn't think is ah, okay. But um, other pe things I would think, yeah, fine, of course I would do that. <laughs> of course I would exceed the speed limit. Of no, I'm not going to say, whatever. Um, and, and so um, we use shame as a tool, as a political tool. And, and we don't know that, notice how much we hurt ourselves. And I don't think only the left does it, by the way. So it's basically the right is pointing the finger at the left, but these are very old and very kind of well-used tools. And we've all grown up learning them. And they work so well because we've all grown up learning them. And now kind of the, the I don't mean the, the left-wing parties, I mean the, the um, <laughs> non-political, uh, non-party non left people in society have gained a lot of power in certain levels, just in, in the media, in, 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 the, in, in, in culture, in these debates, we, we've gained a lot of power. And, and so our dysfunctionalities become a lot more visible and more obvious. And, and so the, the right can point to them and the left can say, but you're doing the same, which is both true, and we should still we, we should still try to talk to each other in a way that we can both all grow. And, and at the moment, it is, it is really the case. So we we kind of we're not growing as fast as they could, but we're still growing, which also shows we're not all talking as dysfunctional to each other as we think. Not even on social media. And, and social media isn't a mirror of the world. So in Germany, it's less than two percent of all people are on Twitter. So whatever Elon Musk does, it doesn't affect us as much as we think. Um, any questions from the from the floor? You said eventually Hannah Ardent uh, managed to come to terms with the concept of race, but then with love, uh, it was something very different, and she couldn't see how it could be reconciled within politics. So it seems a bit counterintuitive, because love is meant to be something so universal. So based on that, would you say there's something about love which is more difficult than race to um, you know, integrate? Uh, yeah. Well, for Hannah Arendt, love meant the private, as in the, the the realm of the private, and um, so in her. On the other hand, a lot of her work is actually based on love politics. So what she she calls um, nativism. So, so she um, the the driving force in her philosophy is, is the life force. Any, anything that's life affirming, which I would call a politics of love on, on, on quite a lot of levels. But she was very much afraid of the word love, and it, it was I was just surprised that she said, oh, I'm starting to rethink all my ideas about race. Because she had all, all of her ideas about race from Hegel. And Hegel had been one of those people in the Enlightenment who had kind of put the basis for, for race theory. And, um, and, and so he had, he, had, he had said, oh, there are these people and, and they're not part of history. So, so Africa is a country outside of history and so they cannot civilize. And all these, all these things, all these awful things, I don't want to really, <laughs> really um, say them all because um, then the brain is so, so cooperative. And yeah, I learned it. And when you say it to me, I learned, even if it's a bad example. So we should always give good examples, which is incredibly difficult. Um, so it was amazing that a letter, um, that a text, uh, um, a literary text, it wasn't, um, well, it is in between um, ac academia and literature, but basically more literary text, more um, managed to change her mind when loads of people, loads of her friends had really tried to change her mind. So that kind of moved me. And she was still afraid of the word love, but it's also that was so usurped during fascism, so love for... The, the, the leader, the Führer, and all this. So um, I think it's also tainted through that. And you've got to take that into account. Or love for your, uh, pay, pay to, uh, being patriotic, love for your country, and all. Um, when you mentioned Robin Wall Kimmerer and um, 
having much more healthy interaction with the natural environment. But you brought this into an overall discussion of love. How does the love here tie in with concepts such as mutual respect and, and, and care? Um, it's about feeling the connection. And for Robin Wall Kimmerer, it's a kind of a, f a family. So, so she says the plants are ancestors. They've been here longer. We can learn from them. So it's a kind of family love in this kind of... And very often when we talk about care, we do it out of obligation. We've got to care for the environment out of obligation. But it's, it's a different idea. So caring out of a feeling of connection, of love, of... and and. Very often, and even with the Wanganui um, River, it's, it, they, they want to um, be able to take legal action, but they always say, also say the rivers are ancestor and, and we've, we've got this connection and we want this connection to be honored as well. And I find that very interesting and there is um, also a way to, so that responsibilities don't drain us. Very often responsibilities drain us and, and to put these responsibilities on a different level and also, when you've got this connection, it goes both ways. So um, if you care for the river or for the plant, the plant also cares for you, not just by you're able to eat it, but there is a kind of interchange and, and looking at this interchange and, and also opening our mind to the whole world of this. What is our connection? And what kind of relation are we to, to, to the living world around us? And... Um, because we usually don't look at that, so we have we have got no real concept of it, and, and to expand that concept, and, and that's what I find so so interesting with her, and also because it's kind of hopeful, and she never says, "Don't worry, <laughs> just have a different story." Then we don't. So no, no, no. She she is very much. She she does a lot of. She says we've got to get the whatever. So we've got to really do all the all the political hard science as well, but we've, we've also got to work on this connection because just kind of um, doing conservation won't save us. Um, just something I wanted to ask, may maybe a bit related or not, um, how, how do you define love as it relates to love politics? And I say this because I wonder how much of the problems come about of um, I mean, Erich Fromm talk, talked about this well, like, you know, we think of love as a fleeting feeling rather than something, you know, which is full of intention and action and, you know, the, the awareness of responsibility. So, yeah, how, how do you define love? Um, it's very interesting that you mentioned Fromm because I, originally I thought, oh, of course, if you talk about love, you talk about love politics, you've got to quote Fromm. The problem is the more you read from Fromm, the more... <laughs> very you get of him because he's got this idea of oh yes love very very important and to work on it and incredibly important as as to structure society because we all have our roles so men are the active ones women are the subservient ones so he, he really has got this weird kind of um going back to antiquity this idea of we have been balls and then we've been cut into halves and one half of the bow or ball is the man the other half but we are basically part of uh, the man is active the woman is passive so it's all this and we get together and then we are complete and no that's not what i mean but um what i love about erich Fromm is that he thought about it at the time and basically nobody was really doing it which is probably why he still read so much for that so what i mean by love is um <laughs> definition of love. First of all, I like I like um, the idea um, that love is a verb. It's something we do because very very often people say to us, "Oh, I love you so much," and you think, "But you you really hurting me." But I'm just doing it out of love. Um, and what I mean by love is um, probably more in the way of seeing each other as human beings, so not dehumanizing each other. And like in a relationship, when you've got a problem, you've got to solve the problem, and you can't just do it by ostracizing the other people. So in a relationship, if you want to solve a problem, you've got to sit down together and find a solution for it and, and take the other person seriously. And this is basically what Martin Luther King said. He said, oh, um, he, he, he works with God's love for, for human beings. So he says, oh, um, God wants me to love my enemies. Thank God he doesn't want me to like them because I could really not like my enemies, but I can love them like God loves us all. And, and I haven't got this theological idea in this, but this idea of 
even if people do awful things, I've got to still be able to see them as human beings and then extend that concept to, to the whole living world. And that's, um, that's Robin Wakimura's idea of the, the world is, we can't just act upon the world, we, we, we are interacting. And then there are all these concepts. Very often people talk about solidarity and so on. And very often there is th that overlaps. But I like using the word love because people get really jumpy. I <laughs> really like that. Well, because I, I was also wondering, do, would it be more effective to use a different word or framing? Or do, should we actually specifically be using love when we're talking about this? Um, well, I do know that um, most kind of... Um, well, if you, if you want to fight for social justice, they usually had a kind of love ethic. So Martin Luther King had one, Gandhi had one, um, Nelson Mandela had one. So the idea of love politics is not a new one. So we don't have to, I haven't invented it. I'm just basically um, putting stuff together that gives me a kind of way out of this feeling of we're all doomed and we can basically do a lot now, then we will be doomed a bit later. But that's all, we, well, that's all our political rhetoric. So I want a rhetoric of hope that's not just a blind hope, but of, of something that can really change. And I want to look at change, and, and that's, that's how I got to love politics. And that's why I thought, oh, but they're all kind of, um, why don't we connect those? And, and when I read, for example, um, Judith Butler on, on, on nonviolence, uh, her book on nonviolence, that's very much her idea, who are the grievable bodies? And um, so, so who do we grieve about? Whose lives do we consider as lives, for example? There are loads of lives. We think, oh, they can just die because they haven't been really living in the first place. So, um, that's the rhetoric for the people dying in the Mediterranean, for example. Um, and drowning in the Mediterranean. So, um, and I thought, I really love that book, but it made me unhappy because we're so, we're all connected by our vulnerability. Human beings are human because we're all vulnerable. I think that's true, but that's so, in a way, so negative. So we're connected by all having this <laughs> kind of open wound. And, and, and I think that's true, but it's also, we're all connected by love. We're also all connected by wanting, but, but, but I think most human beings care for other people. It, it, that's also what makes us human. And I wanted to find a word, a concept for it. And that's also how I got to love politics. Um, any question or from, uh, yeah. Hi, uh, just a quick question. Um, is a revolution a declaration of love? It can be, definitely. But, and that's, that's what I loved about um, Nelson Mandela, about what I loved about Martin Luther King. They all said, if we talk about a revolution, we've also talk about what do we do after a revolution? How can we talk about healing, um, a reconciliation after a revolution? So, because a, re a revolution without love just tends to become a feast of who can we kill next? Because we have to have this concept in there. So the revolutions that kind of meant the most to me always had this idea of love in them. But it also means that if you look at our society, we don't have to wait for a revolution to talk about healing. So what do we do? Um, so how do we talk about healing in our society? What do we do with, with the aggressors? And I think if you talk about love politics, we have to talk about prisons because prisons are really the op opposite of that. They, they are, they're, not even, they're not even a justice system. It's not, oh, we, oh we, we punish people and then they get better people. That doesn't work. Um, so that, this goes back to Christianity. We have this idea that, oh, um, if you've done something evil, you've got to suffer for it and, and suffer more for it and then you can cleanse yourself. Well, that's just Christianity. Nobody becomes a better person by suffering. They might, but usually they don't. So. Um, our justice system is, isn't a justice system. It doesn't do anything to make people less deviant. So how can we tackle that problem to become a more just society? Also has to measure itself. So how do we deal with that? And that is, um, that, that's, that's a lecture in itself, by the way. But, but that is also something, there are loads of very concrete ways we can apply that to our society. I had a big section on, on, on war and pacifism in there, and I thought, oh, no, I don't want to lose you immediately. <laughs> Cut out. 
Okay, so I'll, I'll just wrap up with one, uh, one last uh, question then. Um, so, so many interesting ideas you've, um, you've introduced. Wanted to know, I mean, this might sound a bit weird, but what, what does love politics look like on a daily basis? Like, how would we see it daily and know that we're kind of moving in that direction? Um, uh, first of all, I, I don't think love politics is a practice like getting up and doing 10 minutes, I don't know, writing down your thoughts or your dreams or whatever. I genuinely think love politics is a structure we need in society. So um, do we want to put our society on the basis of respect and 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 how could how could we implement that and and there are loads of like like look in the prison system and how can we get out of a system that punishes you and it, because the prison prison system is so expensive it costs us so much more than reforming people for example would cost us um, there are loads of brilliant studies being done. There are studies being done by, um, I think, in the 60s, um, they sent a, a nurse to, um, to women who'd given birth um, each week, and they could just talk about problems, whatever, um, and, and they gave them help. And they looked um, at the children when they were grown up, and the pr um, they all had better, they, they did better at school, they did, got better degrees, they, they were less likely to go to prison. So just having this help so um, we could in invest very, very, very concretely in help. We could look at the way, um, uh, we could look at basically, we had the corona crisis, so, so every, everything was shut down, schools were shut down, but exams had to be written. <laughs> First, they, they can't mess with that. So we had the chance to kind of say, okay, we go back and we look at what does work, what doesn't work. And um, I want us to, look at all these things because because we are in, in, in constant crisis so it is we have the crisis always, also always a chance so we have loads of chances to look at it and it's also i mean loads of jobs we don't have to do pretty soon so so the robots will do all of that they've been promising that for ages but but no there will be a, a lot will be done by ai and all this um so there will be loads of people there's loads of skills that we can use for, for all these kind of making connections and looking after people and not just as a kind of, yeah, you do that because you can't find a job, so do that as a kind of community care or, or as a kind of punishment. <laughs> so you've, you've been stealing, so do some. <laughs> so, um, but do that and make it worthy, something that, that you, people respect you for. Me too, that was fascinating. <laughs> Thank you so much. There's so many ideas and thoughts that at least I'm going to be mulling on uh, over the next weeks and stuff. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you so much. <laughs>